And I would say this, what's God's purpose in redemptive history? That is, you know, the history we have laid out for us in the Bible as it relates to human beings. And th the answer to that question is that God, God is at work in redemptive his history to draw up the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to draw a people to himself, that they might commune with him. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because of the work of the Son. It's possible through the work of the Spirit. And we're being drawn together to that point where at the end of Revelation it speaks of God's redeemed people and it says they reign with him forever and ever um, in this new new Jerusalem this new heavens and new earth woo -woo. welcome to Bible theory homie taking the church to the streets homie See what? all right so with this we're gonna go ahead and talk about covenant theology Presbyterian style and with that I got a special guest you know for for those who don't know you uh Dr Master why don't you introduce yourself sure uh tell us who you are and what you do Yeah, so Jesse, thanks for having me on. Um, this is, uh, I'm really glad we were finally able to make this work. Uh, my name is Jonathan Master. I am the president of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary out in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm a teaching elder, a pastor in the PCA, although I don't currently pastor a church. I have pastored for on and off for around 20 years. And, uh, and so grateful to be in the PCA, grateful to be at Greenville Seminary, and uh, just excited about what the Lord's doing. Absolutely. You know, maybe one of these days I'll go out there for uh, one of those oh, free you'd, tours. you'd love it. You'd love it. We'd love to welcome you, Jesse. You'd, you'd have a great time, and uh, Greenville's a nice place, and, and we'd love showing you around the seminary. Oh, yeah. I love seminaries. I love visiting. I visited, like, at least eight or nine seminaries, but I have not visited that one yet. So oh, you got to get, get out here, though. <laughs> you get All right. <laughs> You know, first things first, people would like to know some basic definitions. I think it's helpful in a dialogue where people like to get into their personalities and, and, and where people like to, you know, get into their flesh and fight. It's very easy to do that nowadays, whether it is political. Obviously, that's very easy to do that. We see them doing that all the time and they never define their definitions whenever they're on the debate stage. And I'm like, man, I wish they did that because this is not a debate, but I but the debate is on. You go on Twitter, you go on, you know, seminary campuses, you get the covenant theology word thrown out there and you're going to you're you're about to have like a two hour conversation. So yeah. let's start off for those who are listening. If you can just giving us some basic definitions, it doesn't have to be like thorough. This is what the textbook says, but like, you know, you used to be a pastor. So why don't you talk to us like a pastor, talk to those people out there and just define for us, or at least paint the picture of what is a covenant, what is administration and then what is substance? You know that might be helpful for this conversation yeah good those are those are three good starting places so covenants it's been defined in different ways so there are different nuances that you'll read depending on on which author you consult but basically a covenant is an agreement between two parties that has blessings and obligations and sometimes people will also add the fact that it establishes a relationship it's not always that doesn't always mean that people are meeting for the first time and they make a covenant, but it's it's sort of solidifying and establishing the relationship they have. There are different nuances to that that we could add when we look at the Bible and we look at how covenants are, are made, but, but that's the basic definition. It's an agreement between two parties with blessings and obligations. Now, uh, you mentioned also the an administration. You, we use that term in different ways uh, depending on what we're talking about. But when it comes to a covenant, what it means is how that covenant is managed or how it's presented or how it's, we might say, how it's run. Um, how is it that you administer or administrate that covenant? So how it's run, how it's managed, how it's executed, or how it's, how it's presented to us. And that's going to be important, uh, again, as we get further on into the discussion, because you can have a covenant, as we'll see, 
that is administered in different ways, that is managed or executed or presented in different ways at different times. And substance, though, is um, is kind of at the other end of the spectrum because the, when you talk about the substance of a covenant, what you mean is its essential nature. What is it essentially? And so it can be administered different ways, but essentially what what is a particular covenant. So all those words, I mean, again, right now those words might seem a little vague if you're new to the discussion. But each of those words becomes important when we talk about covenants in the Bible. No, very, very clear. Um, you know, if you did not catch that, rewind that and play it again. So is there any other words that you think that would be helpful, you know, for the listener to understand before, you know, we get into the conversation, you think? You know, that's a great question. Um, certainly what you find when you get into covenant theology is you need to know your Bible. And it's a way of helping you know your Bible. Uh, it's kind of a, it gives you some guideposts for if you're if if you're just reading the Bible for the first time or just kind of studying it for the first time. Ter in terms of terminology, um, the other, uh, it's a good question. I mean, another term that's sometimes used is people will talk about federal theology instead of covenant theology, but those terms are often used interchangeably. Covenant's probably a better way of describing it, but mm, federal okay. is another way that you hear it. And then the only other thing I would say is sometimes people will talk about reformed theology, which is a little bit of a broader umbrella, but covenant theology theology is an integral part of that. Mm, good, good point. Introduce to us the the main premises, the main, you know, columns in this cathedral here. How do Presbyterians view covenant theology? You know, because there, there's different types of covenant theology. Like you said, there's like the Baptists have their view. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think if you, if you talk to devout Mormons have their weird view on mm -hmm. it and like everybody has their own little weird view on it. But like when people are listening to this conversation, they're like, okay, well, what makes you guys so different? Right. Right. So if you can just give us like a little introduction, kind of like a tour guide of how Presbyterians view covenant theology. Yeah. So it's um, a great point. And actually there are a lot of people who, who, read their Bibles and, and preach and teach and, and love the scriptures who don't even really hold the covenant theology at all. So you mentioned a few groups that do, but basically what I think the Bible teaches and what Presbyterians believe about covenant theology is uh, can be summarized in a few ways. First of all, that God relates to human beings by means of a covenant. Now, th th that means that no matter whether you like it or not, whether you've heard of a covenant or not, God relates to his creatures, to human beings in, in terms of a covenant. And that covenant is either going to be the covenant of works, uh, which demands total perfection, and of course no one can meet that, so it always leads to death, or a covenant of grace, in which God graciously gives salvation to those who are in Christ based on the work of Christ. And so that's the first thing to understand. You're in a covenant because you're a human being, whether you like it or not, whether you've ever thought about it or not. We could see that in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. When when God begins explaining his relationship with Adam, he puts it in, in terms of a covenant. The second key pillar, so that's one key thing. The second key thing to understand is that God, in, in, in the covenant of grace, in the unfolding of the covenant of grace, God reveals to us in the Bible the way in which he's going to save people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he reveals that to us almost in, in terms of successive covenants. So if you look in, in the earliest chapters of your Bible in Genesis 12, there's a covenant that God makes with Abraham. Even before that, there's a covenant God makes with Noah. Then there's a covenant that God makes with Moses and a covenant that God makes with David and then a covenant that he calls the new covenant. And in each of those covenants, what you're getting is more and more information, more and more revelation that points you ultimately to the way in which the covenant promises are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in, uh, there's a there's a big picture, which is we're all in covenant. You're either 
your covenant head is either Adam, who was who sinned and who fell, or your covenant head is Christ, who perfectly obeyed, and therefore in him we have salvation. But then the other thing is to say, as you read your Bible, the way we understand our salvation is by God's revealing successively through covenants. Does that, does that me, make sense, Jesse? Yeah. I want to make sure that, that that's making sense, because we're kind of talking about, you know, there's overlap there, but, but they're mm-hmm. both important. Now, there, there is another theology out there um, that views the Bible differently in terms of redemptive history, you know, the progressions of these covenants mm-hmm. are coming in progression. They're, they're uh, getting better and better, right? Picture the Dallas Cowboy Stadium at night and there's no lights, zero lights. And you're walking in there with no headlights, nothing. And this pitch black like it is so dark like not even the vending machines lights are on right it's so dark and then all of a sudden across the field you see a little light you're like wow now i could kind of see light and then Mm -hmm. on the other side of the field the third floor you see a light you see the whole third floor lights come on boom and now you see better you're like okay and then you see the big 100 foot tv come on Boom. Now, now you see clearly, right? And then, then, you know, the whole lights come on. That's another analogy, I guess, for those people out there thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, Dispensationalism. I don't think we have three hours to get into it. But if you can, just give us a little contrast of what is dispensationalism and how do they see it based on, you know, the couple analogies that I just gave and how you just explain how Presbyterians see it, right? Yeah, I love your analogies, um, especially the car one. I did a little bit of that kind of work myself uh, when I was younger and uh, and it's a good it's a good analogy. Yeah, so so uh, like you said, we don't have we don't have all night, but I'll try to make it uh, brief. So so at the beginning, one of the first questions you you asked was about administration and essence and and that that was a really actually helpful question for understanding what you're asking now about dispensationalism so what what presbyterianism and kind of traditional protestant theology has said is that the covenant of grace is the same the essence of it is the same in both the old testament and the new testament but the administration of it is different between old testament and new testament that is the presentation of it how is it explained how is it how, how is it how do you operate within it. So dispensationalism would highlight that discontinuity. Uh, instead of seeing covenants as the unifying almost skeleton uh, or frame of scripture, they would see scripture divided into various discrete dispensations, uh, periods of time that are governed by certain commands that God gives, certain, and then if there's a certain particular people that God's working with as well uh, within those commands. And so one of the ways this plays out is that the Old Testament, uh, the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament will then be fulfilled in Israel later on. And because Israel is the particular people uh, with whom God is working. So there's a greater level of discontinuity in dispensationalism because you're dealing with these discrete dispensations where God's working with particular people and giving them particular revelation. And we can learn from it and we do learn from it. But the idea is, you know, that was that was for them. And then also what that leads to then is is some different overall overarching programs of what God's doing. He's his work with the church now versus his work with Israel in the past. Now there are there are nuances to that of course and and one of the problems whenever you get into a discussion like this is you're going to have all kinds of um, different people in each camp who would articulate things a little bit differently. But I think those those may be the the main ones, the main differences. Yeah, I could definitely, you know, because, you know, when I became a Christian in 2006, the first thing I immediately, you know, gravitated to or landed on mm-hmm. was dispensational sure. type understanding of the Bible. I never read those left behind books, but I did see the movie. So, I, and I don't know what I was getting into. You know, I didn't, no one discipled me in, you know, in proper theology or anything like that. And I'm sure many people listening would say, yeah, I, I can't. Uh, relate to that you know so yeah dispensationalism seems you know listening to the way you explain it seems very convenient when it says mm. oh yeah you know that's for them it's not really for us right. like it's an easier intellectual exercise if i could say it like that to say no that's for ezekiel you know what i mean like 
that's Ezekiel. That's his problem. That's what he dealt with. That's the way God dealt with him. But, you know, the way God deals with Paul, 100% different. New car paint, new engine. It's flying. <laughs> you know? You know, he Paul has the Iron Man suit. <laughs> Ezekiel had the, you know, the carton bull. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there there are a lot of good things. Uh, they, they they are reading. One of the reasons why I'm sure you were really drawn to that teaching early on is because they're really taking the Bible seriously. They're studying the scriptures carefully. That's that's really good. And there are discontinuities, of course, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Although although I think those discontinuities are not quite as pronounced along the way as as dispensationalism would teach, but but there are di differences, there are discontinuities, and, and we would say that. Well, I would say that the, the essence of the covenant of grace is the same, but the administration is different between Old Testament and New Testament. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the other thing is when I read the New Testament, and even when I read later Old Testament passages, the way I see them reading the Old Testament is, ver is not in line with what I would think of as that dispensational approach. That is to say, they are understanding some of those early earlier promises in light of what God is doing to them right now and not just pushing them off to the future and saying, okay, that was Ezekiel's vision of a temple for Israel and therefore it's a temple for Israel in the future. So so to me, that's one of the big things is how does the New Testament understand the Old Testament? How does the revelation of Jesus Christ bring together so many of those promises that were initially made to his covenant people of Israel? Good point. Now, I got this question submitted to me by a, a good friend of mine. It says, why should one assume more continuity mm -hmm. than this continuity in yeah. the covenants? So that's part A. Right. And then I guess his part B would be, what is the underlying hermeneutic principle uh, for assuming more continuity than this continuity? That really relates directly to what we just talked about. And and, and I think the, the answer is, I would not so much point to a hermeneutic principle as I would point to how the scriptures and how Jesus and how the apostles read and understand these things. And even how, like I said, the latter part of the Old Testament, like if you if you try to ask the question, how are Ezra and Nehemiah reading the earlier parts of the Old Testament that they had, I think it's right in line with what we're saying. And what I think we see there is that there is great continuity. You look at Paul in Galatians, and Paul addresses the Abrahamic covenant, and he doesn't say that covenant was made with Abraham and his physical descendants, and therefore only his physical descendants, that is ethnic Israel, are going to inherit these promises. No, what does he say? He says actually that all of us who are of faith are children of Abraham and inheritors of the Abrahamic promises. And so you could see that in, in Galatians 3, 14 or Galatians 3, 29. Uh, or if you look at the book of Hebrews and you say, well, how does Hebrews understand the new covenant that Jeremiah revealed to Israel? Well, he sees it as playing out right then and there because of the work of Jesus Christ. And, and if you were to ask the question, well, how does Jesus view those covenant promises? Well, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So I think that the, the short answer is we can talk about hermeneutical principles, but I think it's better to just say, how does your Bible read these covenant promises? Yeah, I understand that Jeremiah is talking to the house of Judah. I understand that God's talking to Abraham in, in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. But the reality is the later, the rest of the Bible shows us that that's actually actually for us or the, the promise to David in 2 Samuel 7 how does that how is that fulfilled well it just so happens that the angel appears to Mary and says it's being fulfilled through the through the, the son that you're going to have by the Holy Spirit. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, forever. And so to me, that's the that's the really important thing. How are these covenant promises understood in the scriptures? And the answer is with a great deal of continuity so that we can say, you and I can say as Christians, we are blessed by the covenant promises made to Abraham. We are Abraham's children through faith. We are benefiting from Christ's Davidic reign, and we are beneficiaries of the new covenant that Jeremiah revealed. And how can we say that? Why can we make those claims? Because the Bible makes those claims. I think that's that's the starting place is looking at how, I mean, it sounds kind of funny to say it this way, but how does the Bible 
Christians understand the Bible? How do the apostles understand the Bible? And I think what you find is that it's consistent with with how how we would understand those covenant promises being fulfilled in Christ and then and then being poured out by the Spirit in the church. Yeah, I totally agree. Because it impacts how, how you mm-hmm. view God's purpose in history yeah. in real time and space. So, like according to covenant theology, what you know, our view here that we're trying to help people understand is what will be God's purpose in history then, you know, with all these covenants? Like, what does this got to do with you know the Aztecs in Mexico or you know, you know, the the, the Chinese party or you know, like right. what what does this got to do with you know history, I guess, God's purpose? Yeah, great question. So I mean I think we could look at this two ways in it in an overarching sense. Everything in all of creation, we know this from the scriptures, everything in all creation is bringing glory to God through his son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I mean, in an overarching big picture sense, what's the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. You could definitely leave it there, but I think what you're asking goes a little bit further than that. And and I would say this, what's God's purpose in redemptive history? That is, you know, the history we have laid out for us in the Bible as it relates to human beings. And the answer to that question is that God is at work in redemptive redemptive history to draw up the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to draw a people to himself, that they might commune with him. How How is that possible? Well, it's possible because of the work of the Son. It's possible through the work of the Spirit. And we're being drawn together to that point where at the end of Revelation, it's it, it speaks of God's redeemed people, and it says they reign with him forever and ever um, in this new, new Jerusalem, this new heavens and new earth. And so when you talk about redemptive history, that's where it's all going. Now, history as a whole, you know, kind of everything that happens, uh, much of which we're we're not given a whole lot of information about, well, that, you know, ultimately is, is going to bring glory to God so that he might be all in all. But in redemptive history, he's bringing a people to himself. And you see this throughout the Bible, even, even in the Old Testament, when you look at the book of Leviticus or, or, or the book of Numbers, uh, what you see is, you know, God's, God's people in the camp and he he makes provision so that people can be here nearer, at least, to his presence. And that happens through the tabernacle and then through the temple and, and through the, the many ways in which God's administering this, this work. But it's a picture. And, and, and then what we read in the New Testament is that God came and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. And, and so in and through Jesus Christ, we're being brought as sons to our Father in, in through the Spirit by the Spirit. Definitely feels a little bit more connection there. You know, I want to zoom in on something you just said about uh, the church, you know, yeah. God's people, it, you know, that's zoomed out. You, I love how you explained that. So if you can just zoom in right here mm-hmm. and just talk about, you know, the covenant theology point of view here on the church age. First of all, mm-hmm. what is the church age? Yeah. W- when did the church, you know, get started? Because there's people out there saying, you know, the church really got started, you know, um, during Pentecost. Before that, right. there was no church. After that, right. there's church. Understanding covenant theology proper. What is the church age? You know, what what is this whole church thing about? You know, and yeah. was Abraham part of the church? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, different people use this in different ways, but yeah, I mean, Abraham is part of the church, and and the church age go in that sense goes back to when God first drew worshipers to Himself after the fall, and and so. Uh, we see that happen very early on in in Genesis chapter four. So in that sense, it, the church consists of believers in all ages, from all ages, who've been drawn to uh, as worshipers of God and, and uh, justified by Him. That's the church. Now, now I want to say though, there there is a sense in which we are dealing with something different because now, after the day of Pentecost, of uh, we we do have well, yeah, after the day of Pentecost, we do have a a different 
different administration of that covenant of grace. We're in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. So those things which were in the past revealed to God's people through types and shadows are now revealed um, in and through Jesus Christ. And and the, the, the sacraments of the New Testament are different from the sacraments of the Old Testament. So there is a sense in which we are dealing with something that is that is new in terms of its administration, but because the essence is the same, the essence of salvation, the, the essence of what God is at work doing and how it is that man is made right with God, that extends all the way back to when God first was saving sinners, uh, which is right after the fall. He was making provision for his people. Technically speaking, church age is isn't really the ch- the church itself is made up of all believers from all time but there is a new administration in the New Testament uh, age, these last days, as the Bible says, in which we live. Yeah, very important, you know, very good um, explanation, very simple. I was really excited to this question. I asked one of my friends and he submitted it to me. So this question is a very particular question, you know, for Mm -hmm. someone who is a seasoned covenantor Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the Presbyterian ways, or maybe learning about it. So basically it says, is the Mosaic covenant a republication of the covenant of works? If no, explain. If yes, explain. Sure. (laughs) Yeah, my answer would be no, it's not. I believe that the Mosaic Covenant is another one of those covenants that we were talking about earlier that is an outworking of the covenant of grace. And here's the reason why. First of all, the, the the Mosaic Covenant is infused throughout it with God's grace. It, it is the, the means by which God continues to reveal himself and his holiness and the way in which his people approach him. And, and, and the Mosaic Covenant beautifully displays that, particularly in the sacrificial system and also in the in the giving of the law. And and furthermore, the, the Mosaic Covenant is given in the context of God's redemptive work. Remember, God doesn't drop the Mosaic Covenant on the people when they're in Egypt and say, you know, do this and and maybe I'll I'll save you, I'll rescue you, I'll redeem you. Uh, He doesn't do that. He redeems them and then he gives them this this covenant. And so I think to see it as a covenant of works is is to make a, a pretty significant error. Now, the reason why people do that is because we know, and the Apostle Paul talks about this, we know that when the Mosaic Covenant was given, because it was joined to the sinful hearts of the people, through no fault of its own, but because people's hearts were sinful, they they didn't obey it, and they didn't keep it, they didn't care, and so it led to death for them and to a curse for them. But that's, again, that reveals very clearly the place of their own hearts, but it's not a flaw or a fault in the Mosaic Covenant, nor does it mean that the Mosaic Covenant is essentially a works system. It's not essentially a works system. I think it's emphatically a revelation of God's grace. Now, if you can, just get into it a little bit deeper, kind of like a Louisiana tick, and just explain, you know, what is republicanism? Just, like, sure. take a couple steps back and be yeah. like, what, what is this? What is the goal for it? And if they're successful, what are the implications to the gospel and to come mm-hmm. in theology if they win well you know yeah we're getting we are getting into that louisiana tick territory i like that i'm gonna i'm gonna steal that i've never heard that before but i think <laughs> I what you mean um so when god when god first revealed himself to adam in the garden and and entered into a covenant with him it was a covenant of works it was adam remember at that time was not a sinner adam had the, the fall had had not taken place adam had not fallen and and so god made made him the covenant head the federal head of the human race and said that there were certain things he had to do and and that that was a covenant of work and and so Adam, of course, as we know, did not obey. He he fell. And so some have seen the fact that there are elements of law. Well, there are lo- lots of elements of law in the Mosaic Covenant, lots of things that you're supposed to do and not do and ways you're supposed to live your life. And they've said, oh, that, that looks a lot like the Covenant of Works. And furthermore, it looks that way because just like that Covenant of Works made with Adam in the garden in Genesis 2, this one ends up leading to death for most of the people who enter into it. But 
I think those are superficial similarities, but they're not, they don't indicate it is a covenant of works for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. What's at stake? A couple things that are at stake. First of all, it, it really, if you view it that way, it really changes how you understand the law because essentially then the law is simply about not revealing God's grace, but showcasing man's sin or worse yet, almost leading man into further into further sin. So I think it, it, it kind of flattens out almost everything that you see in the Pentateuch from the time the law is given in Exodus to the end of Deuteronomy when Moses reiterates it. And, and remember, even after Moses' death, the Lord says, to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. And so, you know, if it's a covenant of works, what, what then what what's what's going on there? What 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 is what's that all about? How do, how does the Old Testament view the law so positively? Why does God view it so positively? And and I think that then flows into the New Testament because in the New Testament you have to ask yourself, in what's why is it that the New Testament writers use the law of God, uh, the Mosaic law, as as a as a way of explaining even some of our own duties today, and they view it very positively. So. I think it has a lot of biblical implications, uh, and I think it's just a miss, I would say, significant misreading of the text of Scripture. Although I say that and, and, and you know, have to add, like with most of what we're talking about, whether it's dispensationalism or covenant of works, there are really good men who disagree uh, on this. But nonetheless, what I'm stating for you is the traditional position that we see reflected, for instance, in the Westminster Confession of Faith and really throughout the Reformed tradition. Let's go ahead and continue and, you know, maybe you can enlighten us and give a watershed moment here on <laughs> this so-called debate. For me, it's not a debate. I see it in scripture. I see it presented in, in, in the West West, uh, you know, so, but still there's good questions out here also submitted to me. So it says here that the sign and seal language can be yeah. confusing. First of all, th that seems to me like a part A of the question here. The sign and seal, first of all, what is the sign and seal? And then what right. is the sign and seal language like in terms of relationship to the covenant? Because that sounds like it's covenant language. Mm -hmm. In, in mm -hmm. other words, why is there confusion? And then it says here, especially for Baptists who don't understand our position. So this is coming from a, maybe a Presbyterian question here. And and then part B, it says, clearly baptism is a sign, but how is it a seal also? Good. So there's a lot in there. Let me back up a step just in case, just in case not everyone is tracking with this. So what we're talking about when we talk about sign and seal is we're really talking about the sacraments. So both the two sacraments, the two ordinances that the Lord Jesus gave to the church are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And what we say about baptism and the Lord's Supper is that they are a sign, that is they signify something. That's pretty easy to understand, like the question implies, but they also are a seal. They seal something something to us. Now, why do we use those two particular terms? Well, actually, there's a really good reason that comes from the scriptures, which is that's exactly the language that's used when it talks about circumcision in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. In Romans 4, it says this about the circumcision of Abraham. It says he received the sign, that is the sign of circumcision, as a seal of of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So there we have that language of sign and seal. And we, we, we understand that these ordinances in the New Testament are both signs and seals. So then the question is, all right, what does it signify and what does it seal? And it sounds like the question is really more going towards the sealing aspect. And, and here's maybe a, a good way to explain it. You know, a seal would be placed on something. Even today we do this. If you, if you have a really important document, if you're buying a house or or something like that you have to go to a notary and get it sealed or and and what that what that means when they put that on there is it, it kind of it makes it clear it, it makes it official kind of presses home the reality of it and the reason why that's so significant when we come to baptism or the lord's supper is that what what the the old writers would call sensible sign that is a sign that appeals to our senses of water it's not just showing us something it's actually god 
God doing something. He's setting his seal and in a sense saying these promises and these warnings, by the way, because there are warnings and promises associated with it. But these promises and warnings are are real. I'm, this is my way of setting my seal upon them. If you look at, for instance, Romans 6 or Galatians 3 or Ephesians 5 or Colossians 2 or 1 Peter 3, in, in each of those cases, the apostles tell us to look back on, in that case, baptism, as a, some, where something happened, where the Lord put a seal and, and that that he showed us something, but he also sealed it. That's significant in terms of our ongoing sanctification. So it's that that's the sealing language. It doesn't, you know, apart from faith, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing about faith in an individual, having water applied is, is not, doesn't, doesn't save anyone, but it is a seal that of God's promises and God's warnings contained in the gospel that we're to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Christ. And that if, if we have repented and believed, even now, if you're baptized, you look back on your baptism and, and that reminds you of what God has done for you in Christ. And, and therefore, that presses you forward into um, that reality, that, sig that sealed reality presses you forward into further faith and repentance in your Christian life, dying to, dying to sin and living to God by the Spirit. So, so that's the that's where the language comes from. It comes from circumcision. We understand it to all. To that's the old covenant administration sign, and now in the new covenant administration, the equivalent of that is baptism, and that also operates as a sign and a seal, as does the Lord's Supper. But I think I think mainly we're thinking about baptism. Yeah, I'm thinking of seal as in like maybe there's different purposes for seals. Yeah. I'm not talking about Navy SEALs. <laughs> <I'm ta> <laughs> so the way you explain it, it seems to me like like the way you use the notary example. Yeah. I'm thinking of those famous wax seals of like yeah. the Roman Caesars, you mm -hmm. know, like, bam, send this message. Or Napoleon, he's sending his message like, help, help, help. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so those are like the Roman, you know, wax seals. Like, if you yeah. broke it there's no going back. You know, like you have to go all the way back, get the special wax and you have to tell the king, yo, you know, I kind of read your, your email. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it seems like a whole ordeal. So you don't want to open that, right? So is, is that the kind of seal that I'm understanding? Yeah. Like, like, I mean, like a that, royal protection? Well, about, yeah. Like private? Like this is my property. Don't read it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's that. Okay. It's, it's putting your stamp on it and, and it, okay. it's, it, it shows everybody this is genuinely yours. Like you've signed, you've kind of signed off on that. This. And also, like you said, it's your property. So sometimes when we talk we talk about baptism, we'll talk about God placing his name on the one who's baptized. Now, does that mean that they're guaranteed to be saved? No, of course not. Because, because the name and the and the promises that are signified and sealed are promises that call us to faith in Jesus Christ. And so it's not that it's, you know, it, it's some automatic thing, but God has placed his name on this person. And that's why for us it has benefits for our sanctification. That's why the logic of uh, Romans 6 makes sense because you look back and you say, you know what? God put his name on me. Yes, I believed. Yes, I repented. But you know, sometimes we get caught up in, did I really believe? Was I really genuine? Like, what, was I in the right frame of mind? And we can we can tie ourselves in knots. And this is a, a another w thing we can look back on and go, no, no, God put his seal and 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 these promises are true. And if I trust in them and, I, and I'm trusting in Christ, then he signed his name to that gospel promise. And incidentally, the reason why, you know, I started with circumcision is because the same logic applies in the Old Testament. So Old Testament believers are circumcised, or, you know, their children, their male children are circumcised, and, and, and it's their parents' confidence in God's promises that cause them to do that. But then what happens is Moses says, here's the thing, you need, you're circumcised in your flesh, but you need to have circumcision in the heart. And so it's, it, Moses does the same thing that we would do. If we went to a covenant child who had been uh, baptized, we would say, okay, you've been baptized. You're a member of the visible community. You've had all these blessings. God has kind of placed his name on you. Now you need to repent and believe. And so that's the same, it's the same kind of relationship of faith to the sign and seal. Great understanding, great explanation. Now, there's another question here that goes a little deeper um, in this conversation. Um, 
in covenant theology once again. But here we're talking about baptism. So in this question isn't implying infant baptism. So he mm -hmm. says, although we see infant baptism in church history, I'd like to stop right there and talk about that for a second. Be like, sure. where do we see it in church history? Why do other people don't see it? Right? So that's my caveat. But let's mm -hmm. continue. It says, although we see infant baptism in church history, it's been argued mainly by Baptists. I'm assuming, you know, by Baptists is here. Reformed Baptists, I guess. That the Reformed slash Presbyterian way of understanding infant baptism is new. It's a new thing. How do we respond to that? Well, okay, so let me try to take that step by step. Do we uh, see infant baptism in church history? Yeah, in my mind, without question. I mean, first of all, I would go all the way back to the book of Acts, because in Acts, you have these households that are baptized. And, you, you know, we can argue over that because it doesn't specify, you know, what age each of the children were and those kinds of things. But nonetheless, there, there are a handful of times in the Bible when it talks about someone being converted. It also says their they were baptized, their household was baptized. So I think you see it there. For sure, you see it in the second century as well. You you see, not begin, but you see infants who are who are baptized. And and it's tough though, because once you get into the early history of the church, some of the references are a little bit are a little bit vague or or unclear. And and it seems to maybe even be different in different regions. We just don't know a whole lot. But there are certainly cases of infant baptism in the first uh, four centuries of the church. And I would say, again, going back to the book of Acts. Now, is the Reformed Presbyterian view novel or new? Well, it definitely is a break from the late Middle Ages because what happens is in the fourth and fifth centuries, people begin to view baptism in, a, in an exclusively sacramental way. Now, sacrament is not a bad word. I used it earlier, but they, they see it as as the way in which God infuses grace into us in, in, in the way in which he saves us. And that that begins early on in the church, sort of fourth, fifth centuries, but then it explodes by the late Middle Ages. Yeah, the reformers definitely re react to that and deny that that's the case. Um, they deny that this is how we are, how how we're saved, that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone. The, the reformers recognize that from the Bible. And then and then when it comes to baptism, they, they ask the question, what does the Bible teach about that? How does that fit into what the Bible teaches? And that's when they start to talk more about how it, the sign and seal of the Old Covenant is then replaced by the sign and seal of the New Covenant in the New Testament. So that part of it, I mean, I don't think it's novel because I think it's biblical, and I think you can find elements of it in the early church. Remember, one of the things the reformers always said was, we're not saying anything new. We're not doing anything new. We're going back to the to the scriptures, but also back to the early church. They appealed to the ancient church over and over again. What they were saying was, look, this whole system that's that's evolved in the in the Middle Ages, and 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 that's not that's not biblical. So I don't think it was novel or new, although it was a break for sure from the late medieval view. And and uh, but I, but I think it was a return to the early church practice and to the biblical understanding. You know, this is the part where, you know, we got to bring it to a close, you know. Okay. It's going by continue. fast, Jesse. This is, <laughs> I know, this man. Quick. You'd be surprised. I feel like there's tons of questions. So if you have any questions, if you're listening, go ahead and write them down below. And I'll make sure that I'll pass those questions on to you in another time. And then, you know, whatever you write back to me, I'll just copy and paste it. So okay. if you have questions for uh, Dr. Master, go ahead and type them down below. Because I didn't. I, I don't have three hours, so I can't be doing a, a Joe Rogan thing where I'd be like asking you everything, right? <laughs> uh, what do you think about Coca-Cola's boycott? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but closing thoughts, bringing it back home. Mm -hmm. that we took off, we went to 30,000 feet, we went to the Grand Canyon, saw the, all this stuff. We, we, you know, we got a cool little tour. Now we got to land it. <laughs> we got to land it. So how would you land this in closing thoughts? Anything you want to highlight, emphasize, you know, bring up again, or maybe exhort us? It's hard to summarize all of this. And like you said, I, there are definitely trails we could have gone down. Well, I would say this. What covenant theology does, certainly it helps us understand ourselves in relation to God, who we are as humans. Certainly it helps us understand how our families fit into what God is doing, how our churches fit in, because churches are covenant communities. It helps us with all 
kinds of on the ground questions like that and kind of unpacks the Bible's teaching in a really useful, edifying way. But more than anything else, what I com- would come back to over and over again is whenever you study the covenants of Scripture carefully, what you are struck with is that they center on the Lord Jesus Christ. It just exalts and magnifies and lifts up the work of Jesus Christ in our salvation. And that more than anything is, I think, the great blessing of covenant theology. Again, that's not to minimize these other blessings. I think many people who've come to uh, convictions about covenant theology have said, oh, this this explains to me, you know, how I relate to my children or how, how I understand the church or how I understand my Bible. I mean, those are big things. But what I think you really can't miss, and if you miss it, you're missing the whole, the main point, is how this exalts the Lord Jesus Christ in his work of salvation, bringing sinners into a a reconciled relationship with God and transforming them from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yes. Christ honoring, Christ exalting. Yes. uh, The glorification of Christ. um, Everything is Christ, like on every page, on every conversation about covenant theology. uh, Yes. Uh, Soli Deo Gloria, right? Amen. Amen. That's right. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and hit subscribe. Don't forget to leave your comments. Like I said, buy a t-shirt, go ahead and support the show. Please, please, please do something for me. Like, at least leave a comment, say, this is great. I don't care what it is. You know, you got it. We got to tell the algorithm. We got some really cool, (laughs) you know, content here. You know what I mean? And uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That goes wonders as well. That's there's three things you could do for free. (laughs) It's like, comment, and subscribe for free. On, on YouTube and Rumble. All right, God bless you. Until next time, grace and peace. <laughs>